that's why people get mad at Monopoly because uh, people end up having everything and there's a couple people that have nothing. Okay, we're recording. I am back. Um, so I don't know if you already started or not, but um, no, nope, we didn't start. Oh, okay, cool. Whenever you're ready. All right. Yeah. Is everyone ready? Yes. Let's go. Let me know when you're recording, Justin. Oh, I'm, I am recording. Okay, sweet. Yeah, okay, so um, welcome to uh, the Kansas Socialist Book Club um, overview of um, the section of Philosophical Trends in the Feminist Movement by Anuradha Gandhi. Now, I did put a picture of Gandhi up on the uh, first slide because there was some confusion between her and Mahatma Gandhi, who was a piece of shit. Um, in fact, Anuradha um, Gandhi criticizes Mahatma Gandhi pretty brutally in uh, some of her other work. So uh, that's her right there. Um, so we're just going to be uh, going over overview of the women's movement in the West, uh, liberal feminism, and radical feminism. So if you haven't done all the reading, that's totally okay. Um, the discussion in and of itself is hopefully going to be useful. So, um, Justin, if you could switch the slide, please. Yep. Does it show up on uh, everyone else's screen? It did for me. Okay, cool. Can everyone else see it? Yeah, I see it. Okay. Awesome. Okay, yeah, so um, the first question uh, we've got here is, um, so overview of the women's uh, movement in the West is just that. Uh, so socialist and communist women were integral to women's struggles for all sorts of rights, including the right to vote, but we rarely hear about them in the United States. Why do you think that is? Why do you think we don't hear about the socialist and communist women who fought for women's rights? Ooh, I, oh, I'm sorry, Noah, did you want to say something? Um, I was just going to point out that during the time of the USSR, uh, they were, had, you know, women fighting on the front lines in World War II. They mm -hmm. had uh, so many women doing uh, a lot of great things. I don't know to what extent. Um, I believe... Uh, was the first woman was going to space um, during the time that NASA was actually rejecting women to just work at yep. NASA. Mm -hmm. So I think that makes the U.S. look really bad when the big, mm -hmm. scary communist countries are actually more accepting to to women than <laughs> they are. Um. Yeah, another thing that I wanted to jump in with is, um, okay, so I admit I haven't done the reading for this week. Um, I need to catch up on it, but I've been incredibly busy. But I also know um, from read the when I did do the reading for the introduction and all that, as well as more generally, like um, the Naxal, the women of the Naxal move, movement in uh, particular, right? They, um, a lot of them joined and, you know, they would do things like engage in armed struggle and uh, proletarian like people's court against, you know, their rapists or, um, you know, and, and I think that the United States doesn't want to set that example of um, oh. militant women, you know, taking action themselves against their oppressors. Because mm. that's not their quote unquote role. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, also, uh, there were even socialist and communist women, and there still are, in the United States and other imperial core countries um, who were active in like the suffragette movement and things like that. Um, but we don't hear about these women. Um, and I think that a large part of that is um, because you know, then Americans might start thinking that maybe socialism and communism aren't so bad. Um, and then, I don't know, join a book club about it. <laughs> um, uh, so I think part of it is that it's a uh, propaganda tactic by the ruling class to snuff out any sort of, um, uh, like, positive views of socialism so that American workers, you know, don't even think about that. 
Any other thoughts? Um, I'm I'm trying to see if I have like something to say, but I, I'm kind of wondering if it has something to pertain to it, like another question later on. Maybe, maybe. Um, you're totally I'll just, welcome. To, yeah, go ahead. I'll just wait till liberal feminism, and then I'll say what I was going to say. Sweet. Okay. Yeah. Um. So the next question. Um. So Gandhi writes in this section that feminism has become more of an idea than a movement. So why do you think this happened? Um, and how does that affect the conditions of women? And what examples do we have of that process? Uh, the one that come immediately to my mind is uh, the Pussy Hat March. And uh, I forget yes. the official name. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm referring to March. for those who might not know is like, um, you, they're like, it was some kind of liberal protest of, forget the context of it, but the idea was like they would epically own the, you know, evil fascist conservatives by putting on a pink hat with like cat ears or something. Um, and and with how that ties into this quote, right, is uh, how, um, well, one, it's an example of that process because it's like the point of a protest should be to disrupt something, right? It should be to, um, to, to, put some kind of pressure on power and like standing around in a crowd with a hat on is not like not that that's not the move yeah I, I agree i have seen stuff like that and they absolutely don't challenge power i mean i guess it's it, it shows there's a lot of people interested in this mm -hmm. but it's like i don't know if you don't have any kind of like strategy to challenge power or any kind of like uh <clears throat> anything to go with that then it's just kind of uh aesthetics or it's just or a show i guess yeah absolutely um i think the other thing that comes to mind uh to me is um justin trudeau the prime minister of canada talking about how canada is a feminist country and how he's a feminist meanwhile you know murder you know meanwhile uh murdered indigenous women go completely you know unreported in canada um and canada does you know the judicial system does absolutely nothing to help women who have been raped or abused um by their partners or their bosses you know i think about corporations who say oh we're feminist corporations while you know underpaying their women workers um and just kind of allowing um, all kinds of sexual harassment and disgusting misconduct to go on. Um, so why do you guys think this happened? Why do you think feminism became more of an idea than a movement? Um. Oh, I, I got my, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's fine. You can go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, um, I view it as like, um, so the, the liberal idea of protest is like, kind of like a psychological release valve. Like, obviously, I think the pink hats, if I'm not mistaken, was in response to the Me Too movement. Um, of like, you know, women who are coming forward with stories of being sexually harassed and assaulted um, by mostly men. And so... Um, you know, obviously that's a valid concern, and I'm not trying to talk that down, but, like, the reason that it's it happens this way, and I guess how it affects the conditions of women, is that from the perspective of the ruling class, which is overwhelmingly men, um, they see it like, okay, we'll let them yell and scream and make a big fuss, and then back to work on Monday where I can sexually harass my secretary, right? Um, so to answer the question, I think it, they let it do it that way, because it becomes like a release valve without actually changing anything. Yeah. It gets rid of the anger. Very good point. Yeah, I was actually gonna, I was going to say something like that. Uh, I kind of like how capitalism will take movements and it'll just commodify them. It'll say, oh, wow, there's a lot of people who are, you know, pro-feminism or pro-feminism and, you know, they wear the pink hats and they mm -hmm. have this certain like colors or attire or aesthetics or whatever. And then that'll sell it to you. And then, you know, uh, some people feel like they're doing something positive when they buy this brand instead of that brand. Cause this brand is the good brand. That's, 
you know, pro me, pro feminism, and they don't feel like they have to do anything else because they're choosing this particular brand marketing over all the others. Absolutely. Uh, Madi, do you have any thoughts on um, why this happened? Well, I like what Noah just said, and I wonder if it's um, the tendency of, of society to um, to transform, you know, sometimes organic movements into mm -hmm. sort of a commercialized version of, of that, or if it's a tendency of individuals to... It, or misguided, perhaps, individuals to try to work within a system, such as, for example, capitalism, um, to, to promote messages that are, that they believe, you know, are worth, um, toggles are, that are worth uh, supporting or pursuing. Um, I just, that is the tension I, I, I um, am thinking about is whether it's an individual, um, whether it, it's it's something that starts with an individual with the individual, or whether it's a, sort of a societal imperative under capitalism, for example, or under neoliberal politics. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, like the interplay there between the individual and the um, social structure and the economic base. Um, so, what other examples uh, do we have? That anyone can think of of the process of movements becoming ideas the first one that comes to mind for me is decolonization um where we'll hear like um people saying like oh let's decolonize your social media feed or decolonize your um you know decolonize your syllabus or something like that um but they don't, of course, mean, you know, fight for the sovereignty of indigenous nations uh, to get their land back. No, they mean just like, I don't know, read more writers of color, which is good, but that's not what decolonization is. So, um, and uh, welcome, classic Caleb. Um, so, does anyone else have any other examples of how a movement became more of an idea? Martin Luther King Jr. And, and the civil rights movement more generally. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, I think it was freaking um, one of those reactionary governors, like either it's DeSantis or uh, Abbott in Texas. Who, or no, it was Ted Cruz. So, um, and he, he tweeted something about how, like, there was some protest going on. And he made it like, oh, well, uh, the NAACP and Dr. Martin Luther King did great things and you know, back in the day, and they would be disgusted at the way you're protesting. So it's like, I think it was the Lenin quote that says, like, during the lifetimes, true revolutionaries like Dr. Martin Luther King are hated uh, and reviled mm -hmm. by the ruling class. But because they're popular, after they pass away, they're kind of um, taken and turned into, like uh, you said, um, a, a, um, like a symbolic idea. And I mm -hmm. think the reason that they do that is because, like, um, you know, like, whenever you read radicals like him, uh, he obviously threatened the capitalist social order, right? Um, and they don't want people to mimic that. So they, they kind of pacify the uh, memory of the person or the movement and make it compatible with capital. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd Go ahead. echo that, too, because... Uh... Martin Luther King Jr. actually came to Manhattan um, at K-State. I forget which year, but to speak. And um, it's kind of funny because they always, you know, every uh, – to, like, celebrate his birthday, they already – they, like, come out with the, the quotes and some of his speeches, but they will never, ever talk about how he was critical against capitalism. Absolutely. And they – you know, there's nothing that really fundamentally changed here about K-State or Manhattan, as far as I'm aware, except they put a statue in on campus and they changed the street. And I believe they changed it um, after Black Lives <coughs> Matter protest. Uh, they changed uh, the street. I think it was Denison. I, I I think it was Denison. I forget what street it was, but they changed it to Martin Luther King Jr. Drive. So it was just 
you know, very symbolic. I don't. I'm pretty sure he his whole goal wasn't to get a street named after him. Sure <laughs> something a little bit bigger than that. One hundred percent. Oh, and in school they they kind of teach you that his goal was to get to end desegregation, and that was it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, like when I was in the army, it was like uh, this is one of the greatest ironies is they would celebrate. Oh, remember. You know, the commanding general of Fort Riley says, remember the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. And meanwhile, if you ever listen to that man's speech, it's like, as he called it, one of the three great <laughs> evils, right? The triple threat of, uh, he called it, I believe it was um, militarism and um, materialism is in like greedy, you know, like obsession with consumer lifestyle, not like the Marxist materialism. And um, I forget the other one, or racism, right? So it's like, here he is on one hand talking about how the military is fucking evil, and then on the other hand, the commanding general's like, remember his legacy of this guy who yeah. did everything we do. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Um, Caleb or Mati, if uh, either yeah. of you have any thoughts on yeah. other examples we have of that process, go yeah, go ahead. I have something to throw in, and I, it's still honestly, it's about the U.S. civil rights movement. Um, and I think that is one. Um, that's one example where I feel like it was uh, more purposefully than than uh, than just naturally. It more than it. Um, it was more pur purposefully transformed into an idea or just pushed into a corner. Um, you know, into maybe a a, a type of. Um, uh, procedures, things for for companies to do, things like DEI, for example. And I'm not an expert on on that area specifically, but it feels to me like that is um, one really good example of the movement that was transformed into maybe just um, a set of policies that uh, don't seem to have succeeded at the you know the core uh, cause of, of 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 the civil rights movement, and as well as separated the um, the concerns um you know the the concerns of, of of racism for example from the concerns of uh of oppression or of, of financial or or economic oppression um and and so we come we find ourselves now at a point where not only have has you know have the goals of the civil rights movement not been attained within the last you know since then since for, for you know 50 years after the movement itself mm -hmm. but now there is not even a, a perspective, uh, a consensus, or a perspective on, you know, what the goals were, uh, or and how they are, you know, both economic and um, racial, and and and, um, and so now we find that, for example, companies are moving away, or or um, governments of states, for example, are moving away from initiatives like DEI, which probably did not even solve the the solution to, to start with. And it just feels to me that we find ourselves without a uh, common perspective about, you know, how to fix society. No, that's a very good point. Um, how kind of like as soon as they got a chance to, they being, you know, the ruling class, uh, as soon as they got a chance to just like throw out even the minor little, um, little steps that they made, you know, um, as soon as they got a chance to, they just, you know, throw even that out. All right. Uh, Justin, could you switch the slide, please? It is switched. Okay, sweet. Yes, it is. So, uh, still an overview of the women's movement. So, in this section, uh, Gandhi also talks about divisions in the women's movement. So, for example, some uh, slavery abolitionists were not wanting women in leadership positions, or some suffragettes ignored a lot of suffragettes ignored the conditions of poor working women so uh what effect do these divisions have on movements for liberation hmm. well it's obviously not good um I would say, I it, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I'm still, still thinking. Okay. Um, I was going to say basically like 
instead of uniting around and um, kind of like seeing and uniting around the single enemy, whether it be like um, you know capitalists or men, not all men, I guess, I don't know, um, men or rapists or whatever the case might be, um, what, what happens is that the you know subgroups start infighting with each other. Um, and, and I think mm. that that kind of division takes away focus from the true enemy in this case, which is patriarchy, I guess, as a social system. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's, I was going to say something like that too, because it's like, you know, coming from, like, if I was a woman and, or if I wanted to be a part of your movement, I would want you to have my best interests at heart and, you know, really care about me and my needs um, otherwise, if you don't, then it's like, why should I care about you and your needs and care about this movement if I'm going to be, you know, if I'm not going to get a proper seat at the table uh, and treat it as an equal? Um, and I think that just really weakens m movements. Yeah. Um, like go ahead. I was just going to say, it's kind of like divi divide and conquer. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, another uh, part of that is, like, imagine if we had, like, um, the Me Too movement and all the Black Lives Matter uh, movement and the Land Back movement. If we just had every single one of these amazing, you know, movements that have fantastic radical elements to them, if they just all, you know, joined in solidarity, that would be everybody. That's terrifying to the ruling class. So instead, they'll say things like, I saw something the other day being like, oh, the Starbucks strike is ableist somehow, um, which is like, that that's ridiculous, that especially too. because there is, you know, like, what about disabled Starbucks workers? Jesus. Um, <laughs> yep. You know. <laughs> uh, so, I've seen stupid stuff on Twitter about, like, the uh, MAGA communists or these, like, communists, but they're, like hardcore nationalists and conservatives somehow too mm -hmm. um which i don't understand how you get that i don't know or i wonder you if they don't. like <laughs> I, you don't i yeah. wonder if they like drink the kool-aid where it's like you know people believe communism is super super authoritarian um and they think like oh cool i'm mm -hmm. authoritarian and it's like they say stuff like oh there's mm -hmm. no room you know true communists aren't gay and true communists aren't this and it's so alienating and it doesn't inspire any kind of i don't know it doesn't inspire anybody to go out and fight for that kind of movement it's just dividing it so it's just kind of like dividing it into like factions when um that's not what communism is absolutely um oh yeah mm -hmm. Okay, so with all those with all of those uh, problems that those kinds of divisions cause in mind, how can we overcome these divisions and forge solidarity? I think the first step would just be listening to people and what matters mm -hmm. most in their lives. <coughs> and because, you know, like a lot of these like socialist movements are super, super broad where there's so many different types of people who are have like direct experience with certain things like i've had i have direct experience of getting exploited at work and i have direct experience um just dealing with fucking landlords so that's what matters most to me just because i just have the experience and i you know have know what it's like whereas other people may have more experience with cops and having a terrible experience in juvie or uh getting pulled over a tra traffic stop and being humiliated by the police yelling at him to get out of the car and then forcing him on the ground and treating him like some kind of animal. So, yeah, I, I think just listening to people and finding common ground and realize we're all being, we're all under the boot of the, we're all under the same boot. Absolutely. I think uh, another thing that I would like to add to that is um, making sure that we do try to make our movements um, 
I safe has become kind of a loaded word, but I'm going to use it here anyway. Um, for everyone, for example, um, one of the ways that organizations uh, end up splitting a lot is um, there will be uh, like rampant sexual abuse, and uh, the organization will just avoid confronting that and avoid um, kicking out the abusers, you know, in order to uh, maintain a, a false sense of peace in the organization. Right. And then that just ends up eroding the organization from the inside. Uh, so in order to overcome these divisions, sometimes we have to take sides. In order to forge solidarity, sometimes we have to be a little divisive, even if that means, for example, kicking out um, a uh, sexual abuser from a leadership position in an organization, even if that would cause you know, a lot of confusion. So solidarity means taking sides, which was, I don't remember who said that, but I really like that quote. Ooh, that is a good one. Mm -hmm. I, I want to add, I think of it, um, honestly, it's the same, I think it's the same idea um, that you guys have been talking about, but I think of it as, um, if I put it in one word, I would say trust, to build trust. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm a data scientist. I've done some research on like online fact checking, automated fact checking, and how that could be possible. Um, and one of the main things you have to struggle with is when you get some, when you fetch some information from a source, how can you uh, decide whether or not to trust that source? Um, especially if you can't, for example, cannot directly fact check the information that you get. You look at things like the credibility of the source and things like that. So I think. Um, you know, whether it's within a structure that is credible, like whether it's linked to other websites, for example, that are credible, things like that. There are many ways to get at it. So, and I think when it comes to people and, and groups and organizations, um, being clear about your what your goals are. And I think mm. it's similar to what Alkin was saying about maintaining a space or, you know, an environment that is safe. Um, being clear about what it is you are pursuing and, and what, you know, what your vision of safe, for example, is like, and being consistent uh, with that. You know, one thing I, I really like about Justin, for example, is that you really, um, you, you know, you consistently uh, phrase your argument with people who are not, you know, not, not socialist or not inclined, not so inclined um, in a consistent and coherent manner. You know, you're always uh, you say who you are and, you know, and you, you're clear about your goals and your beliefs and, and your vision and so on. And I think, and so I think that's, um, that's to start with, you know, that's a base or a foundation on which to build and, and maintaining that trust allows you to maintain like channels of communication where, you, you know, movements have to change because the world is changing around us. So movements, they have to change, but keeping on point or on goal and, and, you know, maintaining some sort of coherent um, message throughout, I think is really important. Oh, wow. Thank you for that, Madi. Um, <laughs> I appreciate the kind words. <laughs> um, no, I kind of want to piggyback off that. I just want to say um, everything Madi said was correct, but there's a quote by uh, this this man you might have heard of. His name is Mao Zedong. I don't know if anyone here has ever heard of him before. <laughs> but uh, no, let me pull up the thing. The Democratic Party? Yeah, yeah, he's the... <laughs> exactly. Um, but he said... In the Red Book, he said, who are our friends? Who are our enemies? This is a question of first importance for the revolution, right? So kind of like Mahdi was saying, um, it is very important to, to define that, especially the enemies, right? Because if we're talking about a social movement where there is a tangible enemy, like the, the patriarchy in, in general, um, hammering home like, A, like we have our differences, but I think that our differences with our common enemy are much greater than the differences between ourselves, right? So in other words, uh, reminding and educating people that the contradictions that you might have with someone else, um, although they are real, they're non-antagonistic and they're non-primary, meaning that they're not mm -hmm. like the big fish you want to fry. Non-antagonistic contradiction is such an important point, I think, to this question. Um, all right, yeah, so everything you guys have been saying has been fantastic, by the way. Um, so uh, next we have, so March 8th is International Working Women's Day. 
It was inaugurated by German communist leader Clara Zetkin. So why do you think March 8th is not widely celebrated in the U.S.? I know a good reason is because we don't have uh, it's not a holiday where you get the day off absolutely yeah why do you think um, um, why do you think that is though why do you think March 8th because in a lot of countries uh, they do get March 8th off even like Britain um, but uh, so why do you think like we don't have March 8th off or March 8th celebrations um, in the US So the traditional role of uh, women, especially in a fascist society like the one we inhibit, is they're, they're child raisers, you know, they give birth. And, and if you look at any politician, that's, um, you know, they're like, oh, that's the mother's sacred duty. And again, motherhood is very special, and I'm not, I'm not trying to denigrate parents or anything, but like, you get what I'm saying, right? Like, that's, that's in our society, in our culture, that is so patriarchal and, and even fascist, it's like, that's why they, that's, uh, goes to your second question. Alchemy is like, mm -hmm. why do they, um, you know, like what role does mother's day play versus the militant May 8th, March 8th holiday? Well, mother's day reinforces that role of, well, women are destined to be, um, homemakers and raise children and give birth. And I think that's a reason why we don't see that in America. We could see, see uh, that makes sense because we do value our uh, memorial day and um all the other military holidays um because that's that's because the guys were go, going off to war to fight and they want to promote that you going mm -hmm. dying and fighting for your country for other countries natural resources more than like a holiday that actually meant something um not to say like i i don't know i guess world war ii is like the only good <laughs> world war ii and um against the nazis and uh the civil war against the slave owners and uh the revolutionary war are probably like the only wars i think are justified but um other than that the other wars didn't mean anything and this actually would be a holiday or is a holiday that um actually meant something there was like some kind of ideology and purpose oh. behind it that's a very good point i would also like to uh add in here that when you look at march 8 yeah march 8th celebrations around the world they're usually riots like they're uprisings like march 8th is a day that um uh you know, even like the uh, the the siege of the um, uh, Winter Palace um, in um, 1905, I think what touched off like the first Russian Revolution uh, was a massive strike of angry women workers. Um, mm. So this is um, and Anuradha Gandhi, uh, the author of this book, does touch on this um, later when we get into uh, liberal feminism, which unfortunately I didn't have time to uh, uh, I didn't have space to put that particular question in the liberal feminism section. But she talks about how bourgeois women or the bourgeoisie uh, and bourgeois women in particular are terrified of mobilizing for women in large numbers. Um, and so I think that's got a bit to do with why March 8th is not widely celebrated and why we instead have Mother's Day, um, because, you know, uh, the U.S. ruling class really would like women to think that they're docile and nurturing and caring, and some are, and that's fantastic. So are some men. Um, but it really wants to snuff out that fighting spirit that as many women as men have um, which is a lot of times in a lot of other countries sort of released on in March 8th demonstrations where women go, you know, and storm capitals and, you know, uh, burn police cars and, uh, you know, burn effigies of politicians that have taken away their right to abortion and things like that. And the U.S. does not want that. Oh. 
And Clara Zetkin, wasn't she in the KPD and like the, the militant yep. underground mm-hmm. wing? So that makes perfect sense. Wow. Zetkin's a badass. Yes. I kind of wonder if um, the U.S. is very different from Europe because a lot of European countries mm-hmm. have such a long, long history um, and recent history of overthrowing you know, monarchs and lords. Ooh. Whereas the U.S., we've mm-hmm. overthrown a king that is foreign to us, that is somewhere else on an island that wasn't presently here in America. So I kind of wonder if, because we don't have that history of fighting or um, going after lords that are lording over our country that are here, um, that we don't... Um, like a lot of Americans, particularly like ruling class white cis men, um, they feel like they the revolution is over and we've won and we have you know the perfect capitalist system and we're America, the best country in the world and you know every history there was like that quote where it's like the end of history where um you know it was like a quote in like the 1990s I think. It's like communism's gone and capitalism won and, you know, everything. Yeah, that was Francis better. Fukuyama. Oh. That was his thesis. Yep. Mm-hmm. I have something, uh, <clears throat> just a, a comment on all that real quick. As a non-American um, and not really knowing the history behind, you know, this national holiday or the other. It seems to me overall that uh, that national holidays or national um, national holidays in the U.S. are very well curated, you know, to to give off a certain theme and to you know theme that's fantastical a little bit, you know, American mythology, um, you know, Columbus Day, um, uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and someone who you know b- before coming to the U.S. There's this view of the U.S. as being, you know, um, a top democracy generally, a place where, you know, despite the despite everything, the people still get somehow do get their way because, you know, they're allowed to protest and all. But it's very it's um, it's almost it's not quite, but it's almost like protests in, in Egypt in the early 2000s where, you know, they have to get permission beforehand and and then everyone who is even just you know peripherally peripherally related to that permission is obviously tracked and surveyed from, from from that point onwards and they're just a small group of people and they're standing in some you know particular place and they're very isolated from mm-hmm. the rest of the people who watch them getting beaten up and taken into police cars in the end so it's just it, it, it seems to me and then i i think I, again, I, I don't really know the history. I haven't lived in Europe, but I feel like what Noah is saying resonates with me is like the difference between the U.S. and some European countries as the U.S. having. I feel like the U, in the U.S. there is interest in, you know, su- just supporting this idea of a shining city on a hill or something, which is not true in any sense, but it's still uh, keep, keeping the fantasy. And part of which is that, the, you know, the role of women in society and and I, I feel like that is just all a package. Um, I've seen a, you know in Egypt I've seen more uh, more conservative conservative conservatisms than than I've seen here. But I've seen, but I mean what I want to say is I did not expect to see the type of misogyny and and patriarchy in the U.S. that I saw over there. But it's comparable. It's just a different mm. uh, cultural you know characteristics. It's very comparable. It's insane, to be honest, especially this year and what's you know the the, the recent the recent happenings and that are mm-hmm. still happening um, with legislation. Yeah, no, I think you and Noah both raised um, amazing points as to like the mythology of the United States and um, kind of how it's kind of all created to curate this sort of image. Um, so. Uh, I will, um, because it seems like we've already kind of touched on it, but I am going to just kind of officially ask the second part of that question, which is what role does Mother's Day play versus the militant March 8th holiday? Um, If anyone has some kind of final thoughts on that. Uh, 
Oh, like Justin mentioned, and we touched upon it just, um, mm-hmm. you know, um, uh, I want to say solidifying the role of women in society as a supportive role to the men who lead, you know, nurturing, loving and all that. And again, it's, I think, I feel it's, uh, it's, it's kind of abstracted from these, um, uh, tendencies, uh, again, compassion and, or so on characteristics. And it's, it's more like it's, um, it's actual, uh, role or task, you know, rather than, uh, than, than tendency. It's, it's not about, Mm. um, the nature of mothers. It's about the role of mothers, um, again, relative to their families, um, yeah, it, it's it's very transparent. Yeah, no, yeah, you kinda, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> um, okay, well, I'll just say, um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, if you look at Father's Day too, like it's like Father's Day is like Dad gets like tools and like a truck and, um, I don't know, and it's like, and like the women, uh, you can kind of clearly see through like marketing and stuff like that that she's the caregiver. She's the one actually taking care mm-hmm. of the child, and the dad's just doing whatever the fuck he wants. <laughs> and um, instead of like how you know I think it should be with how with how like I was raising, or I'm still am raising my son, where it's like it's a team effort where you both have to do unpleasant things like changing diapers and staying up late at night with <laughs> yep. your child and mm-hmm. and um you know i don't as far as i know i haven't really seen that in like advertising or um there's like a video i saw where this uh a divorce counselor or this divorce lawyer saying like most divorces are because the wife is just fed up and it's not putting up with the man not doing anything to take care of kids uh and um should go with this anyway somebody else can talk about this sometimes i'll get it on a tangent and i'll forget no you forget to wrap it up into a point no you're good I, I just wanted to add on to that point real quick is like when a man does st- and i've noticed this like being myself as a parent like they get showered with fucking praise you know like oh such a caring and wonderful dad and i mean I'm not saying, like, men and fathers can be wonderful parents, but it's like, whereas with fathers, it's like society views it as, like, the exception to the rule, and, like, the fact that you're just, I don't know, being a fucking parent is, um, it's what you should be doing, but it's, it's praise, whereas when it's with women and mothers, that's like, oh, well, that's, you know, we just expect you to do that, right? Like, it's, it's kind of assumed, Mm -hmm. and if they don't do it, then it's, or, you know, they don't do it to someone's arbitrary fucking standard, then it's uh, suddenly, oh, you're a fucking horrible piece of shit mother, and we should take your kids from you, and blah, blah, blah. So it's like, yeah. Um, and the, the one last thing I wanted to say was uh, Mother's Day, it is very easy to sell gifts, flowers, chocolates, yeah. you know, whatever. You can't really, what are you going to sell on um, the, the Clara Zetkin March 8th day? <laughs> like, you're going to sell someone a riot? <laughs> Mm, that's true. Yes, absolutely. I do. Uh, I, I'd love to, you know, have a little point about like the, uh, like you were saying, uh, it's a wonderful holiday for capitalists, right? Because, and, and when you see the ads, just like Noah was saying, it's uh, what for like, it just reinforces patriarchy, right? It's um, you either give your mom flowers which are, I mean, I love flowers. Flowers are awesome. Uh, but like, it's a performative thing, right? Or you give your mom, I don't know, a fucking new vacuum cleaner. That's <laughs> offensive, you know. <laughs> you know, something a bit like, darker. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just saying, just like, uh, you know, you sell things that are either that um, just kind of play to a number of sexist stereotypes or like jewelry and shit like that. Oh yes, because women are vain. <laughs> Um, you know, it's, it's kind of amazing, like, being, uh, raised AFAB, assigned female at birth. Uh, I can't re- fucking count how many ridiculous, like, stupid things I've gotten as gifts. It's just, like, makeup and, like, um, it, jewelry and just with, com- with absolutely no, um, investigation done into what my actual interests are or, you know, what I would actually like, you know, for my birthday or for Christmas, no it was leather always jackets. A what? The no leather jackets. 
unfortunately, I had to buy all those myself um, as an adult. Uh, yeah, with absolutely no investigation done into me as a person, just me as a cutout of what a human being with the certain physical characteristics I have is supposed to be. And I think Mother's Day is just another one of those. Um, and I would like to say about holidays in general is um, if you kind of look back in history, um, and I know there's still some practices to this day, but they have just kind of, for the most part, deteriorated in my opinion. But back then when like holidays were celebrated, you just, you'd always have somebody uh, like a, your grandma or somebody like make some special food and you'd have these like certain traditions that were organic that like people put in work to do um whereas like nowadays when you celebrate things or to do things in general is you have to you go buy it you go buy stuff like Mm -hmm. you go out and buy a plastic tree for christmas and christmas decorations and um valentine's day is go buying chocolates and flowers and um and i know other people can celebrate uh, other people celebrate certain ways but it's like it to me it's like the mainstream is just you know just go out and buy what you need uh go buy presents and a tree for christmas go buy uh candy and these like plastic stuff at target for halloween and um and yeah it's like you can't sell that for uh march 8th there's nothing to sell for corporations like what justin said absolutely absolutely all right um let's move on to the next slide beautiful okay now we're getting into the section about liberal feminism so uh first first question um so the bourgeoisie used liberal ideology right the ideology of um equality and free property rights and um you know all that sort of stuff that didn't actually mean um so they use liberal ideology to justify their rise to power but they didn't extend those liberal rights to everyone so why is that why do you think that is well people with power like to keep that power Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, you know, feminism in general is, um, is less power for a man. Uh, a man can't just get away with abusing a woman or can't get away. I can't believe some people still complain about this nowadays, but women can actually divorce their husband. Mm-hmm. You don't have to poison him to get out of a marriage. <laughs> um, and so... You know, um, some people like you could see this, too, when you challenge like a landlord or a property, somebody who owns a business is like they are not going to think about the person that they could potentially be hurting um, or have power over or exploit or whatever. They're going to think about their power and they're going to think like, oh, you want to take away my ability to do things. You want to take away my power and stuff that I've normally been doing that my parents have been doing my grandparents have been doing and people can be very reactionary and think oh no i don't want that and um i kind of want to talk about this a little bit further in a bit um but uh some people will and i think you could see this in old cartoons you can see this today or some people will take it so far where they'll think oh you want women to like rule the world or women to (laughs) rule over everything instead of a man instead of and uh make it seem more like that than just simply treating women equally allowing women to divorce a man just like a man can divorce a woman and stuff like that um and they just they make it seem i don't know it's just kind of like it's just very very reactionary Mm. um but i'll talk more about that in a bit Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, uh, would anyone else like to chime in on? Um, Noah did a very good job there of yeah. uh, why the bourgeoisie did not extend those liberal rights to everyone. 
I want to just go off of what Noah has been saying about, um, just to reiterate, it's from my point of view, it is just consolidation of power, um, mm -hmm. and taking it from those who don't have it or cannot fight for it and keeping it for, uh, the, let's say we're talking about the bourgeoisie, for example, as a group. Um, what I was thinking is specifically, it feels to me like, um, and I think, and I just was, was just glancing at the second question. I think there's, uh, there's, there's a, the contradiction I've been thinking about is right there. And the second question is, mm -hmm. um, when I see the world liberal, I tend to think of individual rights, again, over group rights. And it seems to me, and, I, and again, I'm not an expert in, not really in history, not in law at all, but it, it, it does seem to me in the conclusion that the liberal democracies have, you know, uh, they promote the idea of individual rights and individualism, individual responsibility, and so on, um, over group rights, for example, of workers, for example, of women, of, of, of queer folks. Um, because, you know, when you're stuck within their system, within the system that they promote or are, are basically supporting and funding, um, individual rights are, you know, litigated against the state, if you will, while... Um, and so it, it, it becomes inefficient for it really, for any one person to, to, to try to earn a right that they do not have. That's um, a good point. And, yeah. And I feel like by that, yeah, I, I just, I, I'm glad I was able to articulate it because it's, it's been, you know, in, in, in my head and just that, I, I think of that as opposed to a group of people fighting for taking a right and then, then right, then that right applying to that, to anyone who can fit within to that category. Um, and that just, it got me thinking of that. I think that's a, an amazingly good point. Yeah. Especially with how, um, inefficient it is to, for an individual to fight for their rights. It makes it easier for the powerful to consolidate power. Um, one other thing I'd like to point out, um, another piece of this puzzle is maybe the liberal ideology was never meant for the workers. The bourgeoisie was very clearly not if you if you look at like fucking Henry David Thoreau who I think is a fucking idiot um <laughs> basically like the um 18th century so yeah 19th century equivalent of like Elon Musk sitting in his parents basement um except it was like a pond um <laughs> uh, the the ideology of the bourgeoisie is for the bourgeoisie it's for their rights, um, for their liberal rights, mm -hmm. which I think is one of the reasons it's so important to have a proletarian ideology, because a liberal ideology is really not going to serve the workers. It's not meant to. That's not what it's for. It was meant to justify the rise to power of one class of people, of the bourgeoisie. Before that, there was an ideology, and it still kind of exists, of, you know, of divine right, of the feudal uh, ruling class, that was an ideology for them. So whenever uh, serfs tried to say, well, you know, try to change the um, ideology or the structures at all, suddenly that, you know, the God's grace and all that just suddenly didn't apply anymore. Just like how whenever um, uh, liberal ideology is used by workers to try to assert our rights, it just doesn't apply anymore because it's not for us. It's not meant to. That's not who they're talking to. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. can, I, can I add on to that real quick? Absolutely. Go right yeah. ahead. Okay. So we want to talk about how do they benefit from the subordination and devalued status of women, right? So like, let's, think, let's put our uh, historical materialism hat on and think, okay, because um, uh, it is true, like, you know, the bourgeoisie are very power hungry and, and all that. But there's also a very material aspect to this. And, and so where does a bourgeoisie gain their wealth from? Through the exploitation of labor, right? Um, and in order to exploit labor, labor has to be able to work. Um, and through so much of history, uh, the labor force has been like pretty much all men. Uh, men also have children, right? As I have my own children. Um, and so someone needs to watch those children, right? 
And, and of course, you know, they don't want to like pay child care workers. So the patriarchy and this idea of this ideology of subordinating women directly enables the bourgeoisie to profit because it's like, well, who does child care typically fall on? Women, right? Um, and so in that sense, like there, it is reproductive labor, not just in the sense of like sexual reproduction of birthing another child, but it's also a reproductive labor in the sense of like reproducing profit motive, reproducing the ability of workers to go to work. Um, and this ideology gives it a kind of, um, how do I say it? Like, um, it, it gives people like a mental reason. Oh, of course things are that way, you know, this is patriarchy or whatever, right? Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to hammer home that like, this very much benefits them materially. And it is like a material thing. Yo, one thing uh, I would like to build off that and off of liberal feminism, specifically uh, neoliberal feminism, and how uh, movements become pacified or disrupted, I guess, is um, I'll just say the this whole like the girl boss idea where it's like feminism is you being a girl boss being the business owner or being, you know, like the head of CIA, like the there's like this ad and exploiting workers and making a shit ton of money. And, um, and then you'll see, uh, they'll market the shit out of it. And like what we were talking about earlier with like the, the pink hats where it's like, they'll, they'll put women in movies to market them and shows to market them and all of this, and they'll make them, uh, and they're basically just marketing to uh, women or leftists or liberals, mm. um, just to get them to buy this stuff, not because it's actually saying something or it's there's like a purpose to it. It's just marketing, and um, some of it's done in such like a egregious way, like with the girl boss stuff, where it's like even like conservatives or uh sexists um will see that and instead of blaming capitalism like oh that's a uh a bourgeois capitalist being a girl boss by exploiting workers they'll see that as oh that's women doing that women mm. are terrible and bad and it's very infuriating um when you see like she hulk twerking where it's like uh they'll use this media uh, and I, I haven't watched all of it, but um, just like some of these shows where instead of them being a really cool female character, it's kind of like they just shove it in your face. And it's like um, I I don't take offense of that as like being a man. Like you could shit on men all day. Like I don't care or white people or whatever. I um, But it's just um, infuriating how like they'll take it that way. They'll see that and they'll be like, oh, mm. it's it's not fucking Disney or Amazon being corporate stooges trying to market to liberals. They'll see that as, you know, you know, it was a mistake. They always like you'll see that like on Twitter and stuff like that. I was like, oh, it's because they went woke because they put a woman in <laughs> in this position instead of like a big strong man and uh so that's what I observed. And I think it hurts it because um, it's making it more of something um, like aesthetics than actually helping all women, working class women too, not just women becoming fucking a capitalist and <laughs> exploiting people. Or any like just, you know, in charge um, just to be the girl boss. But anyway, I'll, I'm done rambling. No, you you had all great points. It's uh, they're commodifying, the, um, you know, the the movement. And I, I think of uh, Marissa Mayer uh, always when you know this kind of uh, discussion comes up. Yeah, definitely the uh, the the marketing of uh, that kind of like ties back to like the first question, one of the first questions of feminism becoming an idea, right? Just like a a marketing strategy. Um, so we already did kind of touch on this, but um, how does the bourgeoisie benefit from the subordinate and from the subordination and devalued status of women? 
You guys already uh, mentioned uh, reproductive labor and also having a convenient scapegoat to point to when things go badly. <laughs> I'll just say something like quickly with what I was saying is um, it uh, supports it because it shows like women uh, all your your avenue for change is to just be the boss, you know, to, yeah. to participate in the system and uh, get that bread and work yourself to death to try to be that girl mm. boss. Um, and so it kind of just like directs it. I, I, I think, um, I'm sure you could, that's happened with, uh, like civil rights movement and with like black lives matter where it's like, Oh, or like you'll always see people say, Oh, if you hate cops, just be, just join the force, be a cop and make things, make things right from within or something like that. And, yeah. <laughs> um, they'll, you know, Oh, just, just, uh, go into music and, be a rapper and play basketball and then you know racism is destroyed because now we have wealthy capitalist uh black business owners and wealthy uh athlete black athletes and stuff like that that's a very good point um the girl boss thing is yeah um another thing i'd like to uh put in here is um that the uh bourgeoisie benefits um by destroying worker solidarity. So we have a lot of historical examples of this um, by um, giving um, men a, uh, like men workers, a sort of an outlet. Um, so one of these things that doesn't get talked about enough is like during the transition uh, from feudalism to capitalism, uh, a lot of uh, proletarian workers, by the way, men and women, at the very kind of beginnings of capitalism, it's actually false um, that uh, the idea that men were the majority of the workers, it's actually not true. Um, it was pretty even. Um, but so that created a lot of uh, solidarity where there were a lot of people that could, you know, um, storm the boss's house, uh, et cetera. And these things happened. Um, so one of the ways that some... Uh, capitalist uh some capitalists decided to fix this issue is to divide men and women uh by creating um legal brothels so where essentially men were able to you know things that were before just like the the purvey like the um just like places where like the uh, upper class rich aristocratic men could go and be disgusting uh that was now open to working class men. So working class men could, you know, instead of uh, joining with their, you know, women comrades and smashing the uh, capitalists, they could instead go to a brothel and jerk off, pardon my French, um, while women workers in the brothel were being exploited. Um, and uh, other examples of this are like um, the when women en masse entered the workforce after World War II in the United States, uh, men's and women's wages got closer, not because wages went up, but because men's wages went down as capitalists realized they could employ women for less. And then that brought down the wages of the entire economy, rather of the entire workforce. And then, of course, uh, a lot of working class men not understanding that it was the capitalists that lowered their wages um history rhymes too. Out on women they do that with sorry i was exactly, just gonna say exactly. uh, history of rhymes too because they uh they do that with immigrants too they're like Absolutely. oh immigrants are just taking our jobs but anyway sorry continue no that that was exactly uh that was it yeah no that was um that's exactly what they're doing with immigrants as well um yeah go ahead everyone else i kind of went on for a while <laughs> Yeah, I had I had one thing kind of related to what you said about the brothels alchemy is um not like that um for one I actually didn't know that so like thank you for that because I didn't know that about like the the workforce under capitalism was like even in the beginning I, I really didn't know that so that's interesting. Um, uh, Sylvia Federici's book Caliban and the Witch goes into this in great detail. Oh, okay. maybe I highly recommend that one too. Um, but what I wanted to say though was like I think of the Korean War, right? And um, mm -hmm. on the topic of brothels, they had something called comfort women, which that was where they would literally um, turn, the, you know, the the women of whatever country was being invaded. And Japan did this too, 
uh, and, and you know, mm-hmm. turn them into um, sex slaves, and, and, and the soldiers would rape them. And, and um, so that served a number of social functions that are advantageous to the bourgeoisie, right? Number one, it's, it's a way for the troops to blow off some steam so they're more motivated to fight. Um, and, and, you know, so that's one. But the other one is like women are literally more or less half of the population, right? And if you are an imperialist occupying army, then um, and, and you have this sort, and it, it continues to this day. Like anywhere there's an overseas military base, there's there's brothels. It's like you know the two go together like bread and butter. Um, that's how you subjugate part of the population that could be fight back and resist occupation. Is um, you know turning them into sexual slaves. Um, and they can't fight. Um, that, uh, that's also like directly related to imperialism, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to bring that up example as well. That's interesting too, because that makes me think mm. of slavery too, or or like enslaving people in the past for like in war, where it's like you're turning, you're t- getting these people and you're turning into some kind of like property or commodity that could be immediately appealing to somebody. Um, and then it's kind of like off your hands because now those people are benefiting from it and they're going to want to hold on to that or hold on to those people. Um, so, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, no, these are all fantastic points. Um, let's uh, move along here. So um, this is already touched on a bit by Justin. Um, so... Gandhi criticizes liberal feminism's focus on individual rights over collective rights. So why do you think that is? Um, did I go too far ahead on the slide? I don't... I don't oh, you, I mean, you you, it, you had a point that tied into this question. Oh, okay, so okay. I, you're fine. There's no rule. I mean, there's like... I mean, there's like some rules, but there's no rules about like what... <laughs> what oh, no, I just wanted to make sure that I was on the right <laughs> slide. Okay, so I didn't mean yeah, to cut you off. Right. I apologize. No, wait, no, hang on. Back up. Okay, hold on. Yes, we're still on the liberal feminism. Oh, okay, okay, cool, cool. Yes. Could you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. So, uh, Gandhi criticizes liberal feminism's focus on individual rights over collective rights. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that individual rights uh, over collective rights might warrant some criticism. Uh, I think uh, I had an idea I, I mentioned that I think was, um, you know, relevant to this uh, question, but it actually it came up from the, the earlier question, but the thought was that individual rights are easier to control than our group rights, you know, um, um, if a right is earned by a group, anyone who could say to belong be, to belong to that group, um, you know, is is owed that right. But again, by whom? Um, if, if by controlling ruling class, then it's easier to to you know to to subjugate or to oppress a people uh, by focusing on and promoting individual rights. Because again, it's, it's more difficult for it, for individuals to fight for their rights. And it mm-hmm. is for a group to do that. I think that's like the main dynamic that I think of. Um, but also, it's possibly to you know to just to feed into the the overall um, idea of of dividing people, dividing again men and women, workers, um, dividing men and women in society, dividing workers from others, from owners, and so on. Um, by focusing on individual rights, it's kind of incentivizing the individual to. Um, to have a sense of, in, you know, independence from the group, from the collective, to feel that their own interest does not may not lie with the group or with the collective, or that not that may not be an option. You know, that getting together with people and finding common ground against uh, an oppressor may not even be possible at all. I think it all it feeds into all of that. Yeah, I I agree with that too, and I just think of uh, you know every individual is different and they have their own different experiences and they also have different material conditions too. so you know here in the u.s we have a, a right to a public defender so if i'm getting like if i get sued or if i just get caught up in something 
and I don't have money for a lawyer, uh, one will be provided for me. And if that wasn't a right, um, if I was wealthy, I, I wouldn't really care if that's a right or not, because I could just go get a lawyer myself. I've got the money and the funds, or I could find somebody who will. Um, but if I was poor, um, I wouldn't have anybody to represent me, and I'd be at a huge disadvantage. Um, so I think if you advocate for individual rights, um, there's only so many uh, rights that individuals probably going to care about, or is at least going to relate or pertain to them. Or as like collective rights, it's uh, like I'm a sorry, big I have to go because I have to everybody. go to take care of my kid. Um, you guys are more than welcome to hang around, but I have to stop the recording now and then drop off. I'm sorry. Okay, you're good. Um, but feel okay, free that's... to hang around if you want. Thanks, Justin. Um, that's all right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Justin. Okay, I'm going to stop recording this and then, yeah. Okay.